the Regional School Committee to order. This meeting is being conducted as a hybrid meeting. Our school committee members are here in the auditorium, along with members of the public that choose to join us here. Uh, the following committees are in attendance tonight. Evelyn Abaya Isaiah, Ben Blumenthal, Jenny Krimmer, Amy Krishnamurthy, John Peterson, Nora Shine, Andrew Sor Schwartz, and myself, Adam Klein. Tessa McKinley and Yebin Wang are absent tonight, and Kira Cook will be late. In an ongoing effort to make our meetings as secure as possible, members of the public who wish to comment during the meeting were asked to register 24 hours prior to the start of the meeting using the link found at the top of the agenda. Members of the public who wish to view the meeting may do so on Acton TV's YouTube channel found at the top of the agenda as well. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website at actontv.org. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Okay. That constitutes my welcome as well. Glad everybody could make it in the downpour we were having today. This weekend looks to be significantly nicer. Uh, public participation. So if there are members of the public who are here, here in person or pre-registered and would like to speak about an item that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand so they can be recognized to speak for up to three minutes each. Please. I'm Isha Gangoli. I'm the new liaison from the Finance Committee to the School Committee. So, lovely to see you all. Excellent. Welcome. Thanks. Okay, moving on to the superintendent's update. So good evening, everyone. Um, I apologize. I have a number of different things I'm managing, including Zoom and everything else. Um, one of the joys of this pandemic. Um, so I have a number of different items, and the print version of this is on the table in front of you. Um, but you know, one, we just had a nice class, of the, a picture of the class of 2025 from the high school, uh, from what their incoming day. So we shared that with you in the update. Um, you know, one of the big update items tonight is remembering 9-11. So this Friday, our schools have a variety of plans to mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. At both the high school and junior high, an announcement will be made at 845 about the historical context of 9-11, which will be followed by a moment of silence. The high school will also include the performance of a musical piece and share information about local events commemorating the anniversary of 9-11. The junior high uh, will ask students to write a hope for peace message on paper cranes that will then be hung throughout the school halls. Each of our elementary schools will include activities that reflect the school's culture and that are age appropriate. This may include class discussions in the older grades and school-based activities and traditions such as the Peace Walk that happens at Douglas. Families who wish to learn more about their school's plans can reach out directly to the school principal for additional details. On Saturday, September 11th, the Town of Acton invites the community to a ceremony marking the 20th anniversary of 9-11. You can read about that event on the Town's website, which we'll be linking and sending to families tomorrow. Um, you can also learn more about the 9-11 Memorial uh, here in Acton, which is located at the Public Safety Building on Main Street on the website of the Acton Historical Society, and we'll be sending that out as well. Um, Tomorrow, which is Friday, September 10th, 2021, is World Suicide Prevention Day, and I want to thank Don for the information for this. But over the last five years, our AB community has experienced a number of deaths by suicide with current and former students. While these tragedies have had a huge impact on our staff, students, and community, their families continue to feel the loss of their loved ones every day in ways most of us cannot imagine. Every 11 minutes, someone in the United States dies by suicide. For every death by suicide, there are 25 additional suicide attempts. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 34, the fourth leading cause among people ages 35 to 44, and the fifth leading cause among people ages 45 to 54. We're inviting our community to take a minute and watch the 2021 World Suicide Awareness Day video produced by To Write a Love on Her Arms, titled Another Day With You. We took this week uh, to also remind staff that as we continue to work our way through a global health pandemic with far-reaching repercussions, many of our students have experienced or continue to experience significant life events and or trauma, which have implications on their mental health and well-being. 
This is one of many reasons why building relationships with and knowing students is the most important thing we do as educators. In all of our new staff orientations and our opening week messages, we ask our educators to focus on key trauma-informed teacher moves, relationships and well-being, establishing a routine and maintaining clear communication, sense of safety, connectedness, and hope. Finally, we issued a challenge to each of our staff members to do at least one of the following this week. Take a deeper dive into how they can prevent suicide in the additional Safe Schools courses that we offer, uh, titled Youth Suicide Awareness Prevention and Postvention. Commit to signing up for one of our monthly AB Cares Community Coalition QPR trainings, Question, Persuade, Refer, between October and June of this year. And we'll be sending out dates in the next few weeks. They could call a friend or a loved one they are worried about and check in with them. If they're worried about what to say, they can, we have some suggestions about how to start a conversation. And if they don't already follow um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, we provided links on Instagram, Facebook, The Mighty, and or Twitter. Suicide prevention is our collective work, and it's critical that we each know how to recognize the signs someone is struggling and how to, know, how to help them. I want to also talk a little bit about COVID um, and brief health update. Uh, we are in the late stages of discussions with our unions um, around a vaccine mandate for all district staff. This would require all staff in the district to be fully vaccinated. We hope to have more information for our community in the next two weeks. We have had some questions from families about the possibility of mandating vaccines for students. Based on information from DESE, any such mandate would be the purview of Massachusetts Department of Public Health and not within an individual district's authority to mandate. Some vaccination statistics, um, as of today, 90% um, now of eligible high school students have at least one dose. 85% of junior high students have at least one dose. And I'll pause on that for a moment because sometimes the percent doesn't tell the whole story. We actually have about 40 more students who have received their first dose since the last update I gave you. But we have more eligible students as well because some of our 11 year olds have now turned 12. So it's not just about the percent, it's actually about who's getting vaccinated. So those numbers continue to increase. So overall, 88% of eligible students have at least one vaccine dose. That's fantastic. We'd like to see that continue to climb. And we know that over 90% of our staff are fully vaccinated. And again, we are working on that mandate and we'll be sharing more information with you. Um, as of September 9th, we had a total of six individuals in our schools who had tested positive this year for COVID-19. There has been no evidence of any in-school transmission. Based on COVID, current COVID protocols, there are a total of seven students who have been identified as close contacts in school and have been required to quarantine. We are providing access to education through live streaming technology in our classrooms. And then the community, if they want to, can access real-time data about our COVID cases on our school COVID-19 website. Some updates on testing programs. Uh, the district is providing three testing programs this year. We would like to encourage and remind families to provide consent for the district's COVID testing programs. Signed consent forms for families were due on Wednesday, September 8th through the PowerSchool portal, but we've extended the deadline until noon on Monday, September 13th. This will delay our implementation of the testing program, but we do want to uh, allow additional families to get on board. In addition, though, that delay is probably not the worst thing because the state is having some issues scaling up support for the testing program statewide. So I think it's probably a combination of factors, not just the delay in allowing more families to sign up. So one of our testing programs, just to remind you, is the test and stay program. This program is designed for unvaccinated students as an alternative to quarantine. Students and staff who are fully vaccinated are exempt from quarantine requirements as long as they are asymptomatic. This program is only for unvaccinated students. Students who participate in the program may continue to come to school after being identified as a close contact, provided they take a daily rapid test in the nurse's office and continue to test negative for seven consecutive days after exposure. When students are not in school, they are required to continue to quarantine. So if they go home for the weekend, they're gonna still have to quarantine. This is only to allow school access. Another type of uh, COVID testing we have this year in our schools are routine COVID safety checks, which is formerly known as pooled testing. The program is highly recommended by both DESE and DPH for unvaccinated individuals and will be offered at all elementary schools, pending participation rates. It's not being offered at the secondary level at this time as our vaccination rate is close to 90% of secondary students and the program is not recommended at this time for vaccinated individuals. 
Um, our goal is to have 100% elementary student participation in this non-invasive testing program. Students who participate in the program take a self-administered sample using a short nasal swab one time per week. The test takes less than 30 seconds to complete. This is an important mitigation strategy to keep our elementary schools safe since vaccines are not yet available to that population. Currently, we have 71% of our elementary students signed up to participate in the routine COVID safety checks. We're awaiting responses from another 650 families, and we actually have fewer than 100 families who have actually declined participation. So we're doing very, very well. I think we have 1,950-ish total responses so far, and less than 100 who have opted out. So that's great participation rates. Um, registration for the testing program, again, is being extended until Monday. Symptomatic testing, uh, we do use symptomatic rapid testing when a student begins to so, show symptoms of COVID-19 after they arrive at school. The reason for that is it can speed up the contact tracing process by as much as two days. This is not a reason to send students to school sick. If a student comes to school with symptoms, they're sent home immediately. We are not doing rapid tests for students that arrive at school sick. That's a parent's responsibility to make sure that students stay home. Um, transportation update, um, you know, transportation, as we returned all of our students to in-person learning, um, I think transportation, um, the volume of students riding our school buses, uh, coupled with, you know, statewide driver shortages, and we have our own driver shortages, really slowed down some of our routes during that first week of school. We had some of our routes running as long as an hour and a half in the first day or two, uh, which is certainly not acceptable. Um, I know our transportation department has made some adjustments to procedures um, and some of their processes. We've also now allowed a driver some time um, to learn routes. And I think, you know, knowing those in the first couple of days, a lot of what slowed us down too were families who wanted to take pictures at the bus stop with students getting on buses and getting off buses. So that has slowed down as well. Right now, our routes are operating generally within that 45-minute guideline that the school committee set back in 2018. Um, so we're doing well in that regard. We are still experiencing some delays in getting our elementary school students, which is the second bus run of the morning, to school in a timely fashion. So we're going to continue to work on that. I know transportation will work throughout the month of September and October to refine each individual route um, and figure out what they need to do to adjust times. But we are working on that. Um, speaking of driver shortages, we actually have some critical employment shortages um, and in a number of areas. And for bus drivers, cafeteria staff, classroom assistants, and substitute teachers. So we are asking anyone in our community, if they know someone who would like to join our team, we are providing the link to our applications online and we would encourage people to send folks our way. Again, critical, critical, critical shortages of bus drivers, cafeteria staff, classroom assistants and substitute teachers. This is impacting all aspects of the operations and I know our principals in particular are really struggling to keep everything flowing with this number of shortages. So we would really appreciate our community helping out by sending candidates our way. I just want to point that after a one year hiatus due to the pandemic, the second edition of our district's annual report has now left the post office and should be arriving in residence mailboxes this week. We're also providing a link to the digital version of the report, which is available on our website. Uh, we just want to thank all of our district staff who were involved in developing that report. It was a unique opportunity to document and share the year of pandemic learning with our community. And then finally, some nice news. Um, our Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant. That's a lot of words. Um, so we're pleased that the district, in partnership with the Town of Acton, will receive approximately $70,000 in state funding via the MVP Action Grant Program for creating an electrification roadmap. This will be a collaborative project with the Town of Acton with the goal of identifying potential pathways for electrification of several buildings over time. Uh, these include AB's central school campuses, including the high school, junior high, Parker Damon Building, and the admin building, the town hall, the memorial library, and public safety facility. So I just want to take a moment and thank our district's energy manager, Kate Crosby, for her work in partnering with the town on this important project. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, or comments on that update. I know it was long, but that's, there's a lot going on in the beginning of school. Andrew. Thanks. Um, I appreciate your update, and thank you for all the incredible work we continue to do. A couple of questions about COVID. Um, the test and stay program, is that active now? 
I know there was some question as to whether DESE had their policy in order. No, we're not fully up and running on any of the testing programs at this point. Um, we just received an extra supplement of Binax Now test from DESE. Um, we called and they were very nice to send us those, but we're not fully up and running yet. Thank you. Um, and, and the last thing is there was an announcement made earlier today on the federal side that OSHA has some new rules that are coming out for any organization with more than 100 employees to mandate vaccinations. And I don't know if that's something we need to keep in mind, but uh, it literally broke an hour and a half ago or something. Yeah, so school districts are actually generally exempt from OSHA requirements, so I don't know as though this would apply to us or not, um, but we would certainly take a look if they came out, but we're working on it kind of independent it's of that It's new anyway. information coming through today, so it, yeah. might, it might adjust your conversation. No, that, that's great. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Evelyn. So um, I have a question about the consent, the parent consent for testing. It doesn't seem to be working on the um, mobile app. The consent form on PowerSchool? Yeah. Um, we can take a look at that. Yeah, it doesn't work on the mobile app. You have to do it on a computer. Is there a way we can fix that? Because we don't, I don't think we really even subscribe to the mobile app. I know as an administrator, I don't, I can't oh, use okay. it in any way. I have to get in through a computer. So I, I believe our parent portal just isn't set up that way with the mobile app. But what we can do, because I don't think we have control over how PowerSchool does that, what we can do is clarify for folks yeah. when we send this out tomorrow. Because I think yeah. it may be part of the constraint in getting folks because I, I, I personally have it on my phone and it's just easier to look at stuff. Or everything else works there except when you have to do like um, update your kid's profile or do any other activity on it. And if it's not, maybe we need to message that to the community to know because... We'll Let me check in with our power school person okay. um, and see if that's even an option that's to, a great point. or if forms yeah. need to be turned on or something. I don't even know, but sure. let me check in. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, to follow up on the uh, vaccination question, when you say all, does that mean part time, bus drivers, all staff would be vaccinated? Is that the objective? That's correct. And um, with respect to the um, pool testing, uh, has there been discussion of structuring some of those things as an opt-out rather than um, an affirmation so that the default would be everybody's in unless you explicitly take yourself out? It, we did have some discussions about that, but just to be clear, what we're actually providing consent for is medical testing in a school setting. And so, you know, you generally don't, my understanding is you really don't want to do medical testing on an opt-out process. Uh, because if for some reason a family missed that, then it really kind of deprives them of their right to be in control of their child's medical information. Go ahead, Emily. So how about vaccine mandates? Are we thinking about, so there may be some religious reasons or other reasons why people may not want to get vaccinated. Um, how is the district handling that if we were to mandate vaccines for everyone. Yeah, so any mandate that we had around vaccines um, would carry an exemption for either medical conditions that would preclude someone from be, being vaccinated or for sincere religious held beliefs. Uh, so that those both of those processes are handled through the Human Resources Department on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, next item is a staffing update. There's no microphone here. Should I use this one? Okay. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, baby. It's great to see you all. So I put a lot of material in the packet. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on a lot of it, um, but hopefully you had a chance to read it. Um, the biggest part is sort of the 
summary blurb of each of our new teachers who we're so excited to sort of have on board. So hopefully you got to read that. It's kind of one of my favorite things that we give to you guys. Um, so we hired 35 new teachers and four new administrators. Peter, now it's not. We are in PowerPoint. Can you work? It worked a minute ago, and now it's not working. Can you advance it or not? Yep. So I will just make a comment. If anyone is watching on Zoom, um, you're not going to be able to hear us. There's something going on with the sound, but we can't fix that while the meeting's going on, unfortunately. So we would encourage people to watch this on Acton TV. I do know we have one or two Zoom attendees, one of which is the principal and the other one of which told us, so I think we're covered. Just a comment, if they can't hear us on Zoom, they can't hear your comment. No, but as I said, one's a principal and the other one told us, so I think we're, we're okay. All right, Marie, I'll control this. And okay, thank you. Um, so we have now 508 teachers. We've kind of gone over the 500 mark. Um, and this year we hired 35 new teachers. 35 is a pretty small number for us. Um, we're generally in the 50 range, and last year we were actually at 63 because we had quite a few one-year positions related to the remote learning program and um, all of the hiring we did for that. Um, with the remote learning program and all those one-year positions, last year we had 25 people in one-year positions. Some of them were replacing someone who was on a one-year leave. Some of them were in new positions created because of the RLP. We were able to keep 14 of those. Um, so they went into one year positions, we were able to keep 14. So we felt really good about that. Um, so really we hired 35, but we kept 14 others. So it was more like 49. Um, and we also have four new administrators. Um, we're excited about our new leadership team and we're going to actually bring our new principals and central office administrators, people who have moved around or are new, to your next meeting for you to meet them in person. Um, we had 15 retirements of teachers and administrators in June. That's a pretty typical year. Um, around between 12 and 15 a year is about what we have. Um, 24 teachers did not return to their positions. That's kind of a high number. Um, I kind of looked over the list. A lot of sort of family decisions. I would say some of it's COVID related. We had a handful of folks who took last year off as a leave of absence, mm -hmm. maybe related to COVID and then didn't come back, that kind of thing. So um, 24 not returning. From a budgetary point of view, um, we budget positions at third year master's degree level of experience, 3M we call it, which is a, roughly a $60,000 salary. We, those are what we budget new positions when we do the budget. And we know most of our retirements at budget time. So when we know so-and-so is retiring, we take their salary out of the budget, we replace it with $60,000. Um, so that's how we do our budget. You'll see that in January. Um, our new positions have averaged 67,000, so above the 3M, but we're still within budget. And the reason for that is between January and now, we certainly have had other people decide not to come back. Those folks generally have a higher salary on average than those that we replace them with. So we kind of put it all into the pot and we watch the budget as we're hiring and we are under budget um, for all of our new teachers. Um, so the next section I wanna go into is around the diversity of the Acton Box Pro staff. I put quite a bit into um, the packet about this. It is something we are working really hard to improve, something we take very seriously um, it's kind of baby steps, but we have made some progress and we, we need to make a lot more progress. Um, so to give you a little background, uh, got it. Um, so 
three years ago, we set a district goal in 2018-19 in to really prioritize increasing the diversity of our educator workforce. Um, we made it a three-year goal. You can kind of see how we broke it up on this slide um, with a goal f to look at our numbers in 2018-19 and increase the number of licensed educators who are racially diverse by 20% from the levels in 2018-19. We wanted to do that over three years. Um, this would be... Um, you know, t June 2021 was the third year. And so by this year, so this was kind of the metric that we wanted to, to look at, we wanted to increase by 20%. It's now time to set the next metric. So part of my goal in sort of showing you this is to kind of float where we go with the metrics and we'll come back with a recommendation about that. So, our educators of color, so in this case, we're talking specifically about teachers and administrators. Um, in 2018-19, we, we had 18 teachers of color. I think we had about 460 teachers at that time, 470, something like that. So 3.5% of our educators were educators of color. Um, again, our goal was to increase that by 20% which was not a large number. 20% um, of 18 would have been 3.6 teachers. We have made progress and we feel pretty good about that, but we need to keep um, moving in the right direction. So over three years, we've gone from 18 to 31 teachers of color. We've gone from 3.5% of our educators to 6%. So to sort of float what we've started talking about um, in our next three years, this might be more of a stretch goal, but we'd like to get to 10% um, as an idea. Um, and and we'll, we'll kind of keep floating that. Um, and we may also come up with sort of a per school goal. Um, that was one of the requests of the um, DEI Family Advisory Group. So. Um, we've gone from three and a half to six. It's still a small percentage um, in a, a district that has a much more racially diverse student body. Um, so we want to keep moving in the right direction. This is across all job categories. Um, so you can see we have over 100 staff of color. Um, and you can kind of see in the various groups, uh, we have quite a few assistants, quite a few bus drivers. Teachers are still on the low end, um, but we want to improve that. Um, and so roughly 100 out of 1,000, so 1,068 is our current staffing number. So it's roughly 10% of our total staff, but 6% of our teaching and admin staff. And this is kind of what we've done each of the last three years. Um, so in 1920, we hired six teachers of color out of 49, so 12% of our new hires. Um, last year, we didn't do as well. Last year, um, was a bit of an anomaly in that we were hiring a lot of one-year teachers. Um, so we got a lot more sort of fresh out of college teachers in those positions. And we were doing a lot of hiring in August because the whole RLP thing came together pretty late. Um, so that's not a great number. It was only 5% that year. Um, and we feel pretty good about this year. We have five new teachers of color out of 39 teachers and administrators hired. Um, so 13%. So we want to keep that trend going. So the next two slides have sort of a list of, of some of the main things we've been doing. Um, you've seen most of this before, so I'll go pretty quickly with it. Um, as you know, we've invested in every single educator in the district attending um, anti-bias training, SEED, seeking educational equity, what is it? 
and diversity. Um, we are more than half of our teachers have been through it. All of our administrators have been through it, except for our brand new ones. Um, we negotiated in our teachers contract that all teachers will obtain seed training um, within a three year window of being hired and within three years, everybody has to have participated in seed training. Um, we belong to several groups that are prioritizing hiring teachers of color. Um, we run job fairs dedicated to that. We are bringing hiring teams to those job fairs so we can move quickly when we meet candidates. Um, we are gathering data better than we did before. We're finding out when people apply. We're giving an optional question um, if they want to identify their race. And then we, we can pull out of our online system any candidates of color and make sure that they get interviewed. Um, there was the Department of Ed ran a two year long diversity network that we had a leadership team participate in. Uh, we started an affinity group for educators of color. We've gotten feedback from them, ideas from them on ways to recruit more educators of color. Um, I didn't put this on here, but one of the issues is in Massachusetts, 8% of all licensed teachers are teachers of color. So the pool from which we can recruit is 8%. That's in Massachusetts. It's not much better nationally. Um, we do reach out to historically black colleges and universities and um, both locally and nationally to try to recruit. Uh, we worked with the DEI Community Advisory Group. They had a hiring subcommittee. You heard from them last year. Um, I have their recommendations on the next page. You all saw the policy that we all worked on last year that really um, put a stake in the ground around our commitment to an inclusive and representative educator workforce. Um, and we're reporting data more regularly to you. So I'm hoping to do that twice a year. Um, and then these, this is exactly what the DEI Family Advisory Committee Subcommittee on Hiring showed you last year. I won't go through it again, but we've done almost all of this. Um, and you can kind of scan through that. We've done um, extensive anti-bias training related to hiring for all of our hiring committees. So Don and I collaborated on that. Um, that's been really well received. We did it for the whole high school staff and then um, individual hiring committees in the other buildings. And so that has helped as well. All right, so that was um, sort of my update on educators of color. This is my last slide and then I'll turn it over for questions. Um, I know many of you are new, just an, where are we in negotiations? We have three unions. Our teachers union is the ABEA, Acton Boxborough Educational Association. Our custodial and maintenance unit is called AFSME and ABOSA is our office support association. Uh, we work really collaboratively with all three of our unions and um, we talk to them regularly. We couldn't have gotten through COVID without our collaboration and the hard work of our union leadership. And um, honestly, last a year ago in the summer and fall, they worked as hard as we did and they met with us all the time and that's how we got to where we got last year. Um, so we are on the second year of a three-year contract with all three unions. So this is the beginning of year two. We will in the spring be coming to you to start to prepare for the next round of negotiations to get your priorities. And, um, and then we will start negotiating early in the fall next year um, in hopes of having contracts ready to go before um, budget process, town meeting, et cetera. We did two agreements last year that were specific to COVID. We did one in the fall and one in the spring. We've just done another one, um, which is really a subset of the spring. 
that is in your packet, um, and it specifically speaks to things like masks, things like um, PPE, but um, the idea that if students have to quarantine, we will live stream them into our classroom so that they're not missing school while they have to quarantine. We hope our quarantine numbers are a lot lower this year than they were last year, but we know our young kids haven't had the opportunity to be vaccinated, so we wanna make sure that we take care of them if they have to quarantine. And um, you've already talked about this a little bit, but we are working with unions on language around a vaccine mandate for all staff. Um, the idea would be once we sign it, which we're hoping will be within the next two weeks, um, staff will have eight weeks to receive their first and second dose of their vaccine. Um, and also when staff are eligible for the booster, they have to get it within eight weeks. So the, that's kind of the guidelines that we're looking for. Please know that more than 90%, it's about 93% of our staff are vaccinated based on voluntarily um, filling out a form to let us know that. So we feel really good that our vaccine numbers are so high, um, but we wanna um, get, every, get us to 100%. So that was um, kind of my summary. Again, there's more information in the packet and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Mary. Questions? Evelyn. So I have questions about staffing. Um, I think that um, we've done a good job as a district to try to get diverse staff. And, um, you know, in three years, we've been able to get to at least half of where we were, um, 2000. 18 to 2022, 20, we're like 6% um, went from 3.5 to 3%. And um, we're doing a lot of work around increasing recruitment for staff of color, teachers of color. But I want to um, just understand, I know you laid out some of the steps that we're taking, but I would like to understand a little bit what we're doing deliberately to get that. because. When I see this data every year, this is the second year that I've seen this, it always brings up memories from my own organization where we said, we can't find the people, we can't find the people of color. All of a sudden, MGB has been able to find two presidents of color and then kind of test away because we were in an airport and we're deliberate about it and we decided we're going to go out and seek them, right? There's a reason why teachers of color are not coming to act in Boxborough. It's not because we're horrible people. They have some hesitations. They don't, they don't feel comfortable being here. Housing is quite expensive in this community. And um, they, don't, they don't resonate with us. They don't see people. Not that they don't see people that look like, but majority of people don't look like them. And they're reading the news about what is going on. So we have to come up with some very deliberate steps to get out there and, and recruit. And I don't see that effort being made. I think we're going to historically black colleges, yes, where 8% of people, of teachers of color in Massachusetts, 8% uh, of teachers in Massachusetts are people, people of color, but there are a lot of people of color, teachers of color outside of Massachusetts that probably have roots back in Massachusetts that want to come back, right? Like our high school principal who came back. There's a reason they have family here. They want to come back. Those are the people who want to seek out. But I don't see that we're making that effort. We're going out and, and it's going to require us spending a little bit more money. And I know people don't want to spend money, but if that's what we have to do to diversify our workforce, maybe that's what we have to do. It has to be a strategic decision that we make to be deliberate about how we actually get out there and recruit these people. And I think that, you know, I have offered, Kara has offered, if we need to speak to people, if these recruits that I don't want to take the job, that we need to speak to them and say, listen, we're great community, we're great people, come here, come work for us. We're happy to do that, but I think that it's evident that after a year, all the tactics that we just laid out isn't really working. 
and that we need to do things a different way. So I, I don't know if you want me to answer or not. I mean, I totally agree with you, Evelyn, and uh, you know, I, we want to hear any ideas anybody has, and that was with the DEI Family Advisory Group. We spent the whole year brainstorming. Um, we, you know, I put up a bunch of what we're doing. We're also working with, we've identified the most racially diverse universities in Massachusetts, and we're going to job fairs in those schools, and we're partnering to bring in student teachers. Um, Fitchburg, as an example, we've brought in several student teachers from Fitchburg. Last year, we weren't able to bring in student teachers because of COVID. Um, and the, the groups that we participate with that run the job fairs are recruiting from the HBCUs across the country and um, reaching out to them. Um, we're piloting trying to do a virtual job fair so that they don't have to travel to be able to participate. Um, but I, I know we need to do better. I'm totally, totally um, open to any ideas anybody has. Um, and the Department of Ed has, you know, that diversity network was all about trying to help improve the pipeline, trying to help districts bring people in, um, bringing in aspiring teachers of color as paras. Um, you know, we're willing to spend some money on this. We just need to really all work together to do what we can. Word of mouth is helpful, knowing that this is a priority for us. We're talking about making a video to sort of do what we can to welcome diverse candidates. Um, anything anybody can think of, we are open to. To build off of uh, what Evelyn was saying in terms of reaching out to a more diverse and broad community, one of the questions I had is that you have set a goal of 10% for the subsequent three years, if I understand correctly. What I haven't heard, and this again builds off of what Evelyn has to say, is what is the plan should you not meet that goal? Because you went from 3% to, excuse me, as I get my glasses on, 6%, which was an increase of in excess of 20% from uh, the previous several previous years. What will the school commit, or what will the administration do in order to meet those goals as opposed to just setting you know, benchmarks in general? Um, I mean, we're going to keep trying to up our techniques of trying to improve our ability to hire candidates of color. What happens if we don't meet a 10% goal in three years? And I'm not saying that's going to be the goal. We're at the beginning stages of talking about what the goal will be, and we'll work with you to help set that. Um, we're going to do everything we can to meet that goal. I, you know, do you, Peter, do you want to add to that? I don't know. You know, I think um, a lot of what we heard from our DEI family advisory, you know, they reported out to us in May of last year. And so we've been working hard to implement a lot of those strategies, but those won't really take hold until we go into the next hiring process in May of this year. So I think it's one thing to set a three-year goal but then we have to evaluate on an annual basis how we're making progress toward that goal and figure out what strategies seem to be working, increase those, what strategies aren't working, decrease those, uh, because you can't just keep doing things that don't work either. Um, and I think we're just gonna have to make adjustments and hone on, a, on an annual basis. I think you know, the piece that resonates so fully with me is if only 8% of all Massachusetts educators are teachers of color and we want to be at whatever percent to, let's say 10 percent we haven't set that but that was a hypothetical if we want to be at 10 percent that means we're going to be, have to be significantly better at this work than every other community in the state because everyone's trying to do the same thing at the same time so that's that's really going to be our challenge um, in terms of trying to increase at that rate but i think you know that's one of the reasons why we've been talking to our affinity group for teachers of color to hear strategies from them, um, 
talk to you know our families who also have actually some real expertise in this work. If you heard the presentation at the end of the year, last year, they came up with some fantastic strategies we're implementing. So I think, you know, unfortunately, there's no magic sauce that anyone has figured out that can just automatically do that, but it's gonna have to be trial and error for what's gonna work to get teachers to A, B. I, I think that there's some magic sauce we probably the, the magic sauce is we have to look outside of that eight percent because everybody wants to tap into that eight percent and much of that eight percent is inner city boston they don't want to come here so we're starting off with a deficit <laughs> they won't leave boston they won't leave dorchester Mattapan. they won't that's where they live and that's where they're comfortable most of them will not leave there and that's where a bulk of that eight percent is so we're starting off with a deficit. That's why I worry that the strategy that we have on the table right now is not gonna work because it's going to be really hard for us to convince people to leave their comfort zone and move here. And that was the same <laughs> strategy that my organization was having because we thought that we could find leaders in Boston. The problem is we can. We have to look outside of Boston. We have to look outside to see who are the teachers that have roots in Boston and are outside somewhere that we can push back? Sure. And, and we have to change our strategy. That's all I'm saying, because we're not gonna be competitive looking to push those 8% that are already in their comfort zone to AB, where rent is so high and people don't look like them. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the goal, um, you know, Part of the goal setting needs to be where we want to be regardless of you know what we think the odds are that we can get there in any particular time and so if the goal really is to have um, staff that looks like our community it, the objective has to be much higher than 10 percent um, otherwise you know if you did 10 percent in perpetuity at the end you'd be at 10 percent and you'd still wouldn't look very much like the community so i fully understand the challenge but if the question is where is our goal you know, my goal view of the goal is it should be 20% or something higher. And then, like a lot of goals, you know, we're, you know, probably not going to do very well initially, but hopefully over time we can work at it and, and we can get there. Um, Marie, you talked about um, turnover generally, um, but I was interested in turnover specifically in our educators of color as well as, you know, what we're doing for entry planning for the new staff generally, but specifically for educators of color, and then also what we're doing in terms of retention activities. Yep, um, we've had very little turnover in educators of color. I think in the last four years, one retired and one moved closer to home, um, but we're watching that very closely. We, um, this affinity group has been a real support system for our teachers of color. Um, and we have one of our teachers and one of our administrators are co-leading it. Um, and they are, one of the projects that they're working on is s sort of a welcoming kit for new teachers of color and what kind of supports we can put in place for them. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get feedback from the people who are walking in those shoes and who have been through the experience here. Um, they're also giving us ideas about how to recruit more teachers of color from anywhere. Um, so I, I think you know, we're, we've beefed up our supports and we wanna have as many supports as possible, but um, yeah, we had, we had another one who didn't come back after COVID. Um, so but we're keeping track of that and watching it closely, but I think our retention has been pretty good. Uh, Marie, I'll just add that what I, what I appreciate most is that we're measuring this now. I, I used to work for a guy and what he, what he would say was those things that are measured are the things that are managed. So it's a, it's a great step to at least be measuring this and reporting on it and that it's at the top of mind, not just from the HR side, but clearly from the committee as well. So thank you. Any other questions or comments for Marie? No? Thanks, Marie. Thank you, everyone. 
Okay, on to our ongoing business. Uh, first item there is a school building naming update. Amy. Okay, um, so I'll just go over through the, I'll just go through the process um, that we came up with to this name, <laughs> which is a, thank you, Peter, for sharing that. Um, so April 1st, the school committee um, voted to establish a naming subcommittee for the new school building. We formed a 15-person committee that included parents and staff from the Gates and Douglas Elementary Schools and the Carol Hebner Early Childhood Program. A member from each town's select board, two members of the school committee, members of the public, and um, Deputy Superintendent Altieri, where he also joined us, which was great. Um, at our first meeting, which was July 8th, uh, via Zoom, um, we discussed the, pot the naming policy, FF and FFR, um, and then developed a letter that was then to be shared with the community asking for suggestions. Um, both the letter and the policy are in the packet, um, if you want to take a look at it. Um, in the letter, we included links to some historical background about the property um, and descriptions of the design of the new building. So the letter went out on, the, on July 12th. It was shared with all parents, staff, and students in the district, as well as with both town halls, and then um, and distributed to all towns, boards, and committees, both towns, boards, and all the committees. Um, we also posted the letter on various social media platforms, and the Beacon ran an article requesting naming suggestions. And we kept it open until August the 15th. So overall, we received 51 submissions. Um, these are not 51 unique ideas. Yet there were definitely people that submitted the same suggestion. Um, but we did get 51 people submitting an idea. Um, we shared this, this, and as part of the submission, you were uh, the, the, the public was asked to um, give, you know, why is this person, what did they contribute, to give a little bit of background about the person or the, the idea of the, the name. Um, so we shared that with the, all of the naming committee um, and had, before we met, we asked each member of the naming committee to come up with um, their individual top five choices. Um, so we met again on August 19th. Um, the committee, we came up with seven uh, top seven choices. Um, the committee thought that naming it after something that tied it, oh, yeah. The committee thought that naming it after something that tied it to the beautiful natural landscape of the area and something geographical would be best. We were able to narrow this list down to two very strong candidates, but we felt as a committee, we wanted to take the weekend to kind of think through pros and cons um, so that we could feel confident in our decision. So we met again on Monday, August 23rd, and unanimously voted to submit the, um, the name, the Boardwalk Campus. Um, and just a little bit about, so for years the Boardwalk has been a place that students would visit to study the changing seasons, environment, ecology, et cetera. It has also been a connector between Douglas and Gates. Many parents and teachers also felt that the boardwalk represents a unity of both Douglas and Gates and now the Hebner Preschool. And with the improvements made through the building project, the boardwalk will be a you know truly true landmark. And it's they've just finished it. So at the school committee uh, at the school building meeting last night, they shared pictures of the finished boardwalk, and it is absolutely stunning. It's yeah. Um, the committee also wants to recognize the importance of the Nipmuc tribal nation who originally occupied the land. So the naming subcommittee decided that they would like to have a land acknowledgement plaque in the building or on the land somewhere to recognize the Nipmuc nation. Um, and then someone mentioned that there's a similar um, land acknowledgement in the Sargent Library, but then I su subsequently I found out it's on the website. It's not actually a physical 
that they haven't actually made a physical plaque or something, which is they're still discussing. Um, so the naming committee took the following unanimous vote to accept the name Boardwalk Campus for the new building and to provide a land acknowledgement to the Nipmuc Tribal Nation. So today I'm asking the school committee to consider this suggestion um, and hopefully we can have a vote on it at our next meeting on September 23rd. And the building is scheduled to open up uh, in time for the tw uh, in August in time for the 2022-2023 school year. So a year from now. That's it. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so again, this is uh, uh, our first sort of read of this. Our policy says that we would hear this proposal and then we would have time to uh, discuss now and then vote at our next meeting. So uh, if there's anybody who has any questions or comments, happy to open that up now. Evelyn. I was a little disappointed <laughs> that he didn't, we didn't name the campus or uh, the school by somebody that meant something to our town. But I also, it will grow on me. I, I, I think it's generic enough that it will not raise any concerns by <laughs> from anyone. So um, is there a reason why we didn't name the building by somebody that means something to this community? Because I know there are a lot of people in this community that this building could be named after. So we had a lot of discussion about um, people submitted um, names related to the place or the ecology, um, and people submitted names of people in our community. And we had a lot of discussion about it and really came to the conclusion. So my kids went to Douglas. Your kids go to, your kids go to Douglas. Um, the boardwalk really has, is a very special place. Um, and then the fact that it was being rebuilt, we felt, we felt strongly that this was, you know, it, it, it really is going to be, it is a landmark for that area for both schools and the preschool. Um, and from, from what we were hearing last night, just the general public, they've been going and we've been getting all kinds of positive, you know, feedback about how beautiful it is. It's great that it's open again. Um, it's, it's a, it's an important feature. So that's kind of where we landed. The boardwalk surely is beautiful and it surely is, you know, a distinctive feature and unifying element of the campus. Having said that, you know, it, it does strike me, and I think this is sort of the sense of Evelyn's comment as a safe choice. Um, and I worry that um, part of the, you know, unwillingness to seriously consider the names of individuals reflects the danger <laughs> in lifting up any individual uh, and how that person might stand up over time. Um, but to run away from that, you know, is really to run away from who we are. So, you know, I, I think this is probably an okay choice for this moment in time, um, but it's not a strong choice. I was just gonna, oh, yeah. yeah um, uh, you made a good point, specifically the idea of what happens when someone whose uh, name you use is later found to not be someone you want to stand up. I come from Cincinnati, Ohio. The second street in Cincinnati was named Pete Rose Way, and he so dishonored his name they took the street away and it no longer exists except inside a small spot of a parking lot. Here in Acton, we did take a lot of time to seriously investigate the opportunity to use folks who have relationships with our community, who are from our community, and who have had a relationship with the, the schools. What we came up with was that every person we brought up had some way of finding controversy, and controversy that wasn't necessary for the schools. 
this is, as you mentioned, John, a unifying opportunity for these schools. We're showing how these two, these three are coming together in one space. And we thought the one thing about using geography or using a way of describing it allowed us to be able to add a little bit of aspirational poetry to the way that we were honoring the building and honoring the community that we're creating inside this space. So rather than looking backward at you know, an individual who was able to accomplish something, we're building a space for kids to accomplish something on their own. That's all. Yeah, I'll add um, when sort of the, the idea got floated of naming the campus versus the building, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to me at first, but then when you start to look at the fact that you've already got three school program names associated with a facility, and what we're really celebrating there and being able to take advantage of consolidating all those schools into one facility was that you, now you have a much larger campus that provides a lot of other items for the community and for the schools. And so I think that not having to refer to a building by four names, but only three, and then being able to refer to that in its location of the Boardwalk campus makes a lot of sense. I mean, adding another person's name into the tongue twister of Carol Hubner, Gates, Douglas, it becomes a lot, and so I think looking at the bigger picture and looking at what we're providing both our students and the community, which is now a revitalized campus that happens to have a, at its focal point a beautiful new boardwalk. For me, it made a lot of sense, and I was really happy to see that come out. Go ahead, Evelyn. So, how are we planning to retire the old names? Given that they've served us so well over the years. Yes, so the no. old names remain. So the school programs, those school names continue to remain. So that building houses the Gates School, the Douglas School, and the Carol Hubner Preschool. So those three names still remain. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Other questions, comments, feedback? Marie? I just want to add one piece. Another thing that the committee really felt strongly about the naming committee was that it provide clarity, that it, it not be really complicated and confusing to people. And there was some feeling that with our McCarthy Town Mary and Parker Damon, like people can get confused about what's a school and what's a building and what's a this and what's a that. So that was part of what sort of led the, the committee to this. And, and you might imagine there, there are gonna be softball fields on what's now the Douglas side. They're going to be the basketball courts, et cetera. So having something sort of simple that then you would say the softball fields on the Boardwalk campus, on the Elm Street side of the Boardwalk campus, or something like that, um, but not confuse what's a school versus what's a building versus what's the property, that kind of thing. So I, th I think the committee felt like this could be more clear to folks. And I, I just say that. Um, the, some of the strongest advocates in that um, subcommittee were the Douglas Gates teachers who, you know, had, had into, are intimately involved in, you know, what happens at the boardwalk in terms of education and for kids. All right. Thank you, Amy. Uh, next item up is our budget update. Dave, I hope we have an exciting meme at the end of the presentation. I look forward to them every time. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Greetings, greetings. So I say preliminary because it's not final. The audit is underway and certified E&D will, will still be another month or so out. But these, these numbers shouldn't change and, and, in my view, won't change materially when all the, when all the uh, tasks are completed. So we've got one slide. First of all, you have specifics for, for most of this material in your memo that you've received. 
So this is intended to be an overview to hit the really top highlights of the, uh, of the material. This slide, you can see the relative sizes of each of the revenues, and, the, and so I put the assessments in for a reason. The, the rest of the pieces of revenue diminish pretty rapidly as far as the uh, proportion to the total. Revenue, uh, I'm sorry, regional transportation aid was a pleasant surprise during the year. If you remember, I reported halfway through the year it looked like we had a significant pickup from the, from the cherry sheet estimate. When the final numbers were, came in, it was another several hundred thousand dollars to the good. And so effectively, $350,000 variance, we effectively took 200,000 of that and transferred it to the Transportation Stabilization Fund. It had to, under the regs, come from uh, a reduction of the comfort sourced by the, the transportation aid. So um, the bottom line is we pretty much hit the number, less than a tenth of a percent from budget. Um, I'll, I'll stop at each one and ask if there's questions on this slide because we, we do to go to different topics. Okay. Again, more detail is contained in the memo about expenditures. This, uh, there, was, there was an impact by COVID and the remote learning program that was undertaken last year. You can see eight different categories where I summarize the total variance, the total turn back, if you will, a million one seventy. There are three items for which I want to call your attention tonight. Special ed tuition net. We don't spend four million five or four million nine on tuitions. We spend over seven million dollars on tuitions. The, it is offset by use of the circuit breaker uh, reimbursement program funds. We had budgeted for a significant amount of circuit breaker for use in FY21, and we held back some of that um, at the end of the year because. The, the, ver the turn back was as healthy as you see it overall. Special ed tuition would have been very close to budget uh, without that. So the, so the holding back the circuit breaker reimbursement uh, made the, the tuition line look a lot worse than it actually was. Instructional departments, there's a, there's a big surplus there. A piece of it, about $200,000 worth, was a decision to fund additional special ed staff at the beginning of the year, and funds were transferred out of the elementary school building budgets. So that's about a third of that variance. Most of the rest materialized when we um, undertook what I euphemistically caused, called a pause in the spring, not a freeze, and what we tried to do was to preserve as much of the surplus at that point through the end of the year, knowing that uh, at that point, for one, we didn't know that the transportation aid was, was going to come in that much higher. Um, other uncertainties, we wanted to make sure we had as strong a replenishment number as possible, knowing that we were using a lot of, of E&D in the following year. And lastly, the last line in the, t in the table, COVID contingency. Fortunately, because of the um, use of available relief money, we didn't need to tap this for COVID emergencies. The, the actual amount spent there, it was something that was out of the blue and unplanned. It was the FY21 payment to extricate ourselves from the EDCO collaborative, which uh, Peter has had talked about on several occasions last year. Questions on this one? We'll just keep going, Dave, and then we'll ask questions at the end. Okay, fine. I've put up uh, E&D numbers for FY20 and FY21. The, budgets, the total budget surplus between years, if you add the revenue surplus and the expenditure turn back here, is pretty much the same 
despite very different paths to get there. The bottom line, the E&D balance is still healthy, although as a percent of the following year's budget is admittedly declining. I'll note, though, that had we used, the, had we level funded E&D, in other words, if, if E&D for FY21 was the same as for FY20, that additional $300,000 would have made the E&D percent 3.5 or unchanged. So it's, so it's a conscious use of reserves in the subsequent year that more or less is driving the dissipation of the overall percentage, in my opinion. E&D is one component of all reserves, and you can see here, I put them all up just for uh, pictorial purposes. It's one of generally sound health, but again, slightly declining. Uh, we should consider this chart and the, the uh, data behind it in setting budge budget priorities as appropriate for the coming year. This next one I'm not going to dwell on for long, but it's going to set the stage for a more detailed discussion at the next meeting about revolving funds. You can see uh, for yourself that there is some work to do to rebuild them going forward to where they were pre-pandemic. So that was a very high level view of FY21 closeout. I put federal relief grant update as a, se as a separate uh, set of slides because it does tell a different story. What we've talked about up till now was relating to the regular budget and the appropriation. This section, as you'll see, will be all about grants. We've, been, we've participated in eight grant relief programs to date. You can see the name of them, how they came to be, uh, uh, how we came to be entitled or eligible to receive funds, and the amount of money we've gotten from each of those programs to date. I had discussed this at times over the past year, so likely you have familiarity with some or all of the individual categories. And overall, there's, there's in excess of $3 million that was spent of federal money to support the re remote learning program, to address safety of uh, students and staff on site relative to taking appropriate COVID measures. And there was, in some cases, some budget or, in the case of food services, uh, funding relief for the district. FEMA is a separate category. To this point, we've identified four accounting periods or application periods, as I call them here. These were, these were for costs that we spent that were, by and large, not budgeted and ne considered necessary in order to get students and staff back into live instruction last fall. As you can see, the first one was approved. We essentially submitted a similar uh, menu of costs, only a lot more of them, in the next one. That was denied. The, the prior administration changed the eligibility rules in September, effective July, uh, with the, to the July-October application that we submitted. It was changed, the, the eligibility rules changed on January 21st, 2021, which is why those dates are so uh, specific. And so, so what we've incurred subsequent to January 21st with the new administration, we do expect to recover. So as things stand right now, we have expended over three quarters of a million dollars on these measures we've received and we expect to receive 137,000. So there's over 600,000 of potential exposure uh, to the district if the, uh, if the rules are not amended in any way, including the potential for retroactive uh, changes to eligibility. I think Peter has said before, uh, hope is not a strategy, but we are hoping 
that there is some change here to, uh, to allow these costs to be reimbursed by FEMA. And note that this will not impact the current year E&D, according to DESE. Deficits in these funds are not going to be held against us and deducted from the E&D calculation. Those are the eight we've, we've participated in and received money for to date. There are three more on the horizon, the uh, Student Activity Opportunity Act Award and the ESSER three programs. We've talked about both of them, the first being a specific early literacy grant, the second being a more general uh, allocation based on Title I. As we've presented, the bulk of this money would be intended to fund the MTSS initiative that you've, uh, that you've been presented, for which you've had presentations. The ESSER uh, allocation also has other uses that, DE, uh, that DESE uh, is requiring as a condition of receiving the funds. And lastly, um, just a very quick blurb because Peter's going to continue with this, uh, the ARPA funding is almost $9 million to the two towns and Peter will take it from there. And finally, just to wrap up the discussion about grants. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Dave. Do you want to talk about ARPA funds first and then go to questions or should we? Okay. so. Uh, questions for Dave about the year-end preliminary report, preliminary year-end report. I know John's just itching to ask a question. Go ahead. I think the most important question is who should we be lobbying with respect to those uh, pending fund applications? As uh, I yeah, am, the school committee. Who, who should yes, we be reaching out to? I'm of the uh, well. I have. I've spoken with um, Congresswoman Trahan's office, Congressman McGovern's office. Um, they are aware of the of this. My colleagues are aware. Uh, Mars, the regional regional school as association, has been reaching out as well. Ultimately, I believe the decision is in the hands of President Biden. That's what I've been told. And he alone can, with a stroke of a pen, change eligibility. We hear things that, think that eligibility and rules may change. It may not be a case of, oh, now they're all, now they're all good. But, but I would be very surprised if this is the final answer from what, from what I'm hearing. The, the direct answer to your question is the usual suspects, legislators, it's federal, so it needs to go up the, up the line. So we should be hitting the, our senators and representatives? I don't see how it could hurt. Okay, um, it, on to the more prosaic. In our regular budget, we do have a small Title I grant, is that correct? Yes. So why is it that we have some Title I money which we consider part of our regular budget, when, but when we got these additional Title I monies, they somehow became a separate category? Title I and the IDEA grant and the Early Childhood grant, a lot of those annual entitlement grants are over there. They're in a separate category. They're akin to the revolving funds like school lunch, like all day K. They're not accounted for with the regular funds because they're not appropriated money. The school, we are allowed to expend those funds as we receive them without the need for further appropriation. That's, in my, in my experience and opinion, a good enough reason because they're not part of the taxpayer's uh, burden if you will, for, for funding the school district. Now, the Title I, it's, it's the, top, the money we got, the ESSER funds we got that were Title I based, in no way relate to the Title I grant funding that we get annually. It was, it was just the basis by which all of those ESSER funds were distributed 
uh, to uh, to the districts in Massachusetts and and in, uh, nationwide. So what you're saying is they're coming from two different appropriations, essentially. The, so what the first half of this presentation was all the tax, taxpayers' money, and the second half was how we spent the money that, was, that came to us, whether directly or through the town of Act, towns of Acton and Boxborough, related to the COVID pandemic relief funding. Exactly. Thank you. So, you know, I certainly understand that argument that has just been presented, but from the standpoint of, you know, total available resources and total services delivered, which, you know, in my view is actually the province of the school committee, you know, it, although you can carve out various things, um, you know, I actually think that the budget dislocation, you know, in terms of total revenue that we had, uh, that went into the RLP and everything else, a total number would actually show you much more what had happened than to have this accounting scheme where we see some stuff over here and some stuff over there. And part of this is, is you know, the past is in fact the past, um, but we have large quantities of money, hopefully, that we'll be seeing, you know, in the next couple of years. And the question is, how should we, you know, how should that information be presented and how should we be thinking about it? And then, you know, just to sort of wrap that all together, um, your uh, slides, I think, were highly suggestive that people who look at E&D all by itself without noticing circuit breaker and some other things would be missing the point. And in fact, if they didn't look deeper and also understand some connectedness to the revolving accounts, um, again, you wouldn't have a proper sense of you know, what kind of reserve the school system actually had. Um, so as everybody here I think knows, you know, I'm a big fan that those things should be seen in a unified way. I think our E&D policy is too narrowly crafted um, to actually provide appropriate guidance about how we should behave um, holistically. And I think it actually, you know, I, maybe it's, it's, it's probably too much for tonight. Maybe we can do it in budget stuff. We can talk about, you know, those individual decisions around, you know, circuit breaker and some of the other things that lead to the final E&D result and how that should be made and, and how that might be made through the year. Just one quick, th uh, not addressing everything, but the one thing to keep in mind is hopefully everything co related to COVID from a financial standpoint will in a historical context be a tremendous anomaly and asterisk. Had we shown the big picture, that blister, if you will, would be, would be there for a long time, whereas, and, and lose some comparability. I'm very adept at, at taking a number and saying, well, look at, we, we're down 5% from where we were in 2021. Yeah, that was the COVID year. It's, to, part of my job is to paint as clear a picture as possible, assuming consistency is is something that will make people go okay i get that that and that's the only thing i wanted to say was covid i'd like to not see remnants of that going forward in in financial presentations that i make to the committee uh, i just have two quick comments the first is with regard to the fema um sort of liability that we have. It's a significant amount, and I would encourage everybody in this committee to reach out to our federal legislators and encourage them to do whatever they can. We basically were planning for pandemic schooling, spent all this money to make our kids safe, and then after we spent the money, the government said, oh, we're not going to reimburse that. So we really need to speak up and make sure that, that we're made whole for that. Um, and the second is, is in regards to the, the reserves in the E&D, and, and John and I will have a, a difference of opinion on how this is presented, which should come to no surprise. But my concern is the, um, wh while the E&D the e numbers themselves look fairly level from year to year, obviously the percentage of those reserves as it relates to our overall budget is declining. It's below our um, policy guidance. And my concern is the reason we, we got to that point last year was, was two items, the, 
the town said we don't have the money to give or we're not willing to and the district said we're not willing to remove services and we have to in this year make that balance somehow because if we continue down this path of using our reserves to provide the services that we feel are necessary we will have no reserves um, so I think as the budget committee goes this year um, and works with the administration to develop a budget um, we need to make sure that we are uh, cognizant of where our reserves position will put us at the end of the year if I can just add one comment to that. Um, also, I think as we think of how we want to use E&D in the next budget cycle, we need to think more of a range that could be available from E&D rather than any firm number. Um, and so the reason I bring that up is because we still have, unless FEMA gets resolved, we have a $625,000 liability that would hit E&D the following year. So. What that means is even though right now e and will probably get certified somewhere in the neighborhood of what, 3.2 million? Um, in reality, that could end up o o after a year being dropped to about two and a half million. So we have to be cautious and be thoughtful that, you know, we, we know what the e and number is going to get certified at and that, that's where it will come back from the state, we believe. But we have to, in the back of our mind, keep in mind that until this deficit gets resolved from the FEMA money, we need to be, careful about that. Regarding the FEMA money, uh, Dave, could you provide us, uh, the members of the school committee, the actual presidential declaration number that the two grants were submitted? I think in reaching out to our federally, um, ele federal elected officials, having that information in, in saying, hey, look, these two grant or this one grant and potentially second grant were turned down, it will give us a little bit more information and a little bit more ammunition, so to speak, to provide, um, a, to uh, request a response back from our federal officials. So you're looking for the specifics of what was denied? Yes, so the presidential declaration number, which was made back in September or whenever it was, mm -hmm. the specific grant application number uh, tied to that FEMA, to those FEMA grants, and approximately the time frame that it was submitted. The more information that we give to our federal partners, the easier it will be for them, hopefully, to reconcile it on their end and work with the president and his staff. I can do that, sure. I'm gonna check around the room one more time, John. Anybody else have questions or comments on the financial update? Is it a quick one? It is. Go for it. I just wanted to uh, pig pile on what Ben said, and I was hoping that Ben would be able to collect this information and it could be distributed through Beth to other people so that we can use his clever wording so that everybody makes a thoughtful request to our legislators. I actually am scheduled to have a, a, a meeting with my contact at um, Lori Trahan's office in the next couple of weeks, so I'd be also happy to have that information to share um, with her office. I have a working relationship with, yep, so thank you. Great. One, one last piece before Peter starts w relative to ARPA is just to remember that this, the FEMA potential liability is out there and he'll explain why ARPA isn't the solution. Does that, Peter, does that make sense to you? Yeah, thank you. So the next thing we want to talk about, and David left off on this in the finance plan, is kind of the next round of federal stimulus, was the American Rescue Plan. And if you remember, this came into law, you know, late spring of last year. So I just want to talk you through some of the very, very high level aspects of this. Um, it is a federal grant program. Um, it provides funds directly to the towns, not to the district. So this is similar to the CARES funding that we talked about last year. Um, and how the money flows. Um, regional school districts can apply to be subgrant recipients of the towns. Um, it can be only used for specific purposes, however. It's not just free money. Um, there are specific rules about how this money is used and uh, to be allocated. Um, and it also has to be for projects after March of 2021. So 
So this is not retroactive money. So only things that actually occurred after March of 2021 would be eligible for this program. Some of the uses, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, there were a number of different categories. There were six or seven major categories of use. Uh, we, as a regional school district, do not qualify for most of them. There are very limited reasons why we would qualify um, to work with the towns on this. One is um, under the broad category of supporting public health response, and that includes services to contain and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So vaccination, medical expenses, testing expenses, contact tracing, quarantine, capacity enhancement. Clearly, we've done a lot of that over the course of the year, and in particular, even after March of last year, that would qualify as well. Um, and that can also be looking forward. It's not just about reimbursement for previous costs, it's actually looking forward to what we need. Um, this category also includes behavioral health services, including mental health or substance abuse treatment, crisis intervention, or related services. Um, we'll share this with you after the meeting so you can read the rest of the categories that are up here. Um, another one that stood out to us is replacing public sector revenue loss, ensuring continuity of vital government <laughs> services by filling budget shortfalls. Um, this is a viable category. Um, there are some, some very, very specific rules to how this is calculated, and we're cautious whether or not this is gonna be allowable for the, the district. Uh, we want to keep discussion of this ongoing with both towns, but this is certainly not an area where we just wanna hang our hats on. Um, Equity-focused services. Again, this is an area where we do think we potentially have some ideas that could qualify. Um, particularly in thinking about um, addressing educational disparities in access, right? So it's, again, it's not just something you do for everyone because it has to have a real equity focus. Um, so you have to be targeting that, that money to a specific reason. So um, there are also categories for water and sewer infrastructure. That's really not our main business as a school district. Um, sometimes we have water and sewer projects. We had a $300,000 cost for Charter Road, however, that's before March of 2021. Uh, broadband infrastructure, sounds like it would be great for the school district. Um, however, if you really look at the wording of what qualifies, it's really about bringing broadband to areas that can't receive broadband. Um, so again, not really the wheelhouse of the school district. We did provide access points for families who couldn't get broadband service, um, but that's not a real need that we see going forward that would be a major, major area for consideration. So the overall funds, um, so as Dave said, there's approximately nine million between the two communities. Acton's allocation is roughly 7.1 million. Boxborough's is roughly 1.7. Just to make it really clear, both towns have expressed willingness to share their funds with us. Um, they're being very uh, cooperative, engaging with us. Both town managers have reached out multiple times. Um, good working relationship in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, there are somewhat different processes that each town has established for how those funds will be allocated. Those processes are determined by the select boards of the towns. Um, and so, you know, the select board in Acton does, isn't responsible to the select board in Boxborough or vice versa. Um, however, as a regional school district, we do have to figure out how we're going to navigate some of the slight nuances in how the towns are creating priorities for spending. So that's something that we had to consider as well through discussions with both towns and learning what their priorities might be, we wanted to craft proposals for the district that could somehow try and fit into those broad categories. So some of our priorities, and I'm gonna ask you not to get too into the weeds on this slide. Um, it's more than I wanted to present, um, but for time, it was the spreadsheet that we had. So some, ma some major priorities. Um, there were certainly COVID mitigation measures taken at the end of last year um, to the tune of about $120,000 that we used specifically to prepare our schools for the full return of all of our students last spring. Um, we also had significant expenses, just under $100,000 for the community food program that we were running um, that has not been reimbursed yet um, between March and June of 2021. Those are two fairly easy priority areas. The first one falls under public health response and mitigation strategies. The second is an equity-focused service uh, by providing meals to the community. Um, looking forward now um, as to what we think we could do with this money, 
we would love to establish a free after-school tutoring program for all students in grades 7 through 12. Uh, we know we have a lot of tutoring that goes on in this community at extraordinary expense to families. We believe we would love to, especially given the pandemic, provide that service free of charge to students. We had a model last year that we tried at the junior high school where we actually reached out to a number of college students and they were providing Zoom tutoring sessions uh, to our junior high students. We'd actually like to have kind of a hybrid model where it's a combination of maybe some college students and our own educators working, you know, at a proportional pay rates to, to do what they do, but providing a mix of in-person and Zoom tutoring. So it's really flexible for kids. Um, you know, we've been looking at the cost of that program. It's about $50,000 a year to do it well um, at both grade levels. So that would be a two-year request of a total of about $100,000. Um, we looked at some other areas where families have to pay significant money and tuitions can be a barrier for families as well. Um, we looked specifically, um, you'll see extended day and all day kindergarten are two areas. Under this equity focused services, we talked really at length, um, in particular with the acting time manager and the whole finance team that's been working on this. We can't just say we're going to take a chunk of money and get rid of everyone's tuition. That really isn't the equity focus that the grant is looking for. So what we did try to do, um, the towns liked this idea, um, in particular Acton really liked this idea. However, what we did is we wanted to target tuition grants for families and we would set our own income level. Right now we provide tuition relief at the free and reduced price lunch level. We know free and reduced price lunch levels don't really count in Acton and Boxborough. Um, they're just not realistic for our communities. Um, so we would like the flexibility to be able to set that level and offer free tuition, um, both for extended day and for all day kindergarten. And we'd like that to be able to last three years because that can also work in concert with a school committee strategy to gradually reduce tuition in all day kindergarten and hopefully eliminate that. As I said, or as Dave said, hope is not a strategy and I just used the word hopefully. <laughs> so I'm gonna catch myself on that. Um, just a, a footnote to this slide, I did put the Acton and Boxborough shares. You know, the towns don't need to follow that regional agreement proportional share. This is town allocated money. The towns can really choose to allocate it however they want. However, as a regional school district, as we propose things, we feel like we have a regional agreement we should honor and kind of try and stick to that guideline to the greatest extent possible. So we did break it out for discussion purposes around what the share lo would look like. It is not exact right now. It's just roughly 85-15 on these slides, uh, but not, certainly not final numbers. Other priorities, um, in line with some of the MTSS work we do, one, you know, we have added iReady, which we've talked about extensively as a screener on the academic side. One thing we're lacking as a district is a social emotional screener. Um, and that would be a complement that we'd like to be able to add. And additionally, some curriculum materials around social emotional learning to, to be able to use in our classrooms. We don't have those identified yet. We actually, if this moves forward, we'd like to work with a group of our educators, counselors, leaders, to actually identify what that screener is and what the curricular materials we want are. But we would like to have an allocation for that. Um, the telephone system, um, the telephone system at Blanchard has been failing repeatedly over the last few years. Um, it absolutely is going to need to be upgraded within the next year or two. Um, and that's gonna be a significant cost. We have a new school coming online over the summer that will have a brand new infrastructure and backbone um, for the entire, that can serve the entire district. We would actually like to use a chunk of this money and a sizable chunk, about $700,000, to actually replace the entire phone service for the whole district at the same time and move, you know, we are one of the only places I've ever seen that is still on copper telephone lines as a large institution. Um, almost everyone uses an IP phone service. One of the benefits of an IP phone service is actually it can integrate with our security platform for lockdown procedures, building safety, everything else. Um, and so that we think is a, a real opportunity to upgrade. It's under a strange category right now of revenue replacement because the revenue replacement function is actually being pooled 
and put into kind of its own category to be able to fund projects that would be outside of categories that would actually work. So if you have a project that doesn't fit a category, you can fit that money into the revenue replacement stream. So that's where we have submitted it. Um, we would like to also, um, based on what we know about the pandemic and moving forward, we actually think there could be a real opportunity to create permanent outdoor learning spaces and renovate some of our existing outdoor learning spaces at each of our schools. The new Douglas Gates preschool building will have beautiful, beautiful outdoor learning spaces. Blanchard has a long-term plan to create outdoor learning spaces. Um, we don't need to fund anything at the new school because that's funded through the building project, but we do think there's an opportunity to take about $50,000 in each of the other six schools, including the junior high and high school, um, to be able to create really nice outdoor learning spaces for students. Um, and that would serve certainly the next few years because I don't think we're gonna be out of the pandemic at any point soon. Um, but it could also really look into the future as a usable space. Um, I mentioned revenue replacement, and this is just a broad category. We don't know how this fits yet, but we need to keep the discussion going of this. As you'll hear at the next meeting, we are extraordinarily concerned about our revolving accounts, specifically due to lost revenue because of the pandemic. We had significant losses in community education extended day program and all day kindergarten tuition. The food services account ended up doing okay through all of that. But in particular, ComEd extended day, all day kindergarten tuition are in, you know, in dire, dire need of replenishment of funds. And then the last one, um, Blanchard miscellaneous improvements. And um, you know, you know, John, I know you were on the Capitol Sub, Adam, you were. This has been an area that we knew Blanchard needed, some significant work coming up over time. We weren't quite sure how we were gonna get to fund that yet. Um, we knew like doors and windows, we'd been applying to MSBA. Um, MSBA wasn't approving the doors and windows that we needed done at the time, so we kept getting denied. Um, we would like to put some additional money into Blanchard. You'll see on an upcoming slide, not only did we think of the 85-15 split between the two towns, but we also tried to think about the overall percentage of the, um, art money that we were requesting from town. So if we were requesting 35% from one town of their allocation, we wanted to try and roughly stay within that. So this last one is one that we're submitting to Boxborough alone um, to kind of bring that percent of the total allocation to be relatively consistent. So the, the broad picture is we're submitting and we have sent in as preliminary requests a total of just over three million in requests um, and that roughly breaks down for the two communities between 37 and 38 percent of the total share um, that that they are receiving through this grant and then in terms of broad categories we have a little over a million categorized as public health response um, about 1.4 million in equity focused services uh, revenue replacement a little over half a million and then specific to kind of working on Blanchard an additional request of about two hundred thousand dollars to be able to kind of keep that facility going for the next few years. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Um, you know, the timeline is very, very tight on these. The, on, the timing of it worked such that the requirement for us to submit something to the two towns has already occurred. So we've sent this in. Um, John Mangioretti is finalizing his presentation for Acton uh, that he'll be giving Monday night. So you'll see these included in that presentation. Um, and in the Boxborough side, the request was actually due like two days ago. So you're hearing about it after the fact, but our hope is if you have comments about how we're doing this or any other ideas of what you'd like to see us do, we can take those tonight and then supplement what we already submitted. Any questions or comments for Peter? Okay. John? If, if we look to add um, a community which has an integrated school system like Lexington, um, they would get this grant, and I assume the grant would likely sort of fall along the usual way in which they distribute money between municipal and uh, school services, which would be north of 60% to the schools. 
So it, it, my high level reaction to this is that um, this you know, nominal 38% number really could be and in some sense should be higher. Um, I, I think with regard to specific things, um, when we look at this again, you know, what would be helpful to me, you know, and it relates to your comment about this doesn't solve our $600,000 problem, it, it, there are a bunch of these things that this is good to do, you know, it's helpful to us if we look like the outdoor space. So we're happy to do it. It's great that this money, it doesn't really change anything about the core services that we're trying to deliver. Um, there are some things, you know, like the ability perhaps to rebuild the community ed revolving account and some of those others, which do directly impact, you know, the way the operating budget is going to, to behave. So it would be nice to see those things broken out separately. And from my view, obviously, my greatest interest is on those things that touch the operating budget directly. I'd love to do the other things. And then the cautionary note would be some of these items, you know, potentially don't reduce costs going forward, but have some potential to increase operating costs in the future. And we should have some special discussion around that. And I'm thinking particularly of, you know, how we're going to manage all day K uh, and some things like that. Just to touch on the last comment, um, there's actually nothing in here that alone will increase an in operating cost. Uh, that was actually a, a high level of concern in Boxborough was not to create ongoing costs for yourself. Um, you know, there's certainly, if we do outdoor classrooms, we have to upkeep them. But that's not a, a huge operational cost on an annual basis. With these, the way we've tried to structure this grant program for extended day and kindergarten tuition, it actually operates independent of what we do on tuition reductions. You know, we know we want to continue that pattern of tuition reduction, but this is really targeted to families that right now can't afford, or it's a burden for them to afford the tuition that we have. So um, we've been try trying to be sensitive to that. Um, I do agree with you. I think some of these costs are definitely revenue replacement. Um, and when we started this process, you know, we don't have the same access to all of the qualifying materials that the towns do because we're not that entity. Um, and so I think a lot of our initial hopes going in were to be able to replenish some of the reserves and, you know, do some things where we had this like FEMA liability out there. But as we really started to learn the grant requirements, all of the things that we thought we really could maybe benefit most directly from, from an operating budget perspective, aren't really qualifying. Um, so that's the challenge. That's why I'm cautious about the whole revenue replacement piece and what that will do for us, but we have to keep talking about it. So it, it's sitting there as a placeholder. Um, so I think those are great comments, and I hear you about separating them out because, you know, Dave mentioned this too a few days ago. Some of these are certainly revenue related, some of these are infrastructure related, and some of them are mission driven. Uh, in terms of what we're trying to do as an organization. So this is all preliminary. Any other questions or comments? Um, I'll just add from my observations, um, hearing from Peter what, what direction he's getting from John and the, the Acton leadership side and my participation in the Boxborough leadership side, we're, we're still sort of talking apples and oranges and how this process is going. And so I would encourage members of the committees, particularly the select board liaisons, the finance committee liaisons, ALG members, all of you to continue to remind the towns that we appreciate their participation in this and that we need to work together to find the right mix of projects that speaks to both of those towns sort of differing goals. And that maybe like Peter said, the balance at 8515 doesn't line up the same way, or maybe the total number does, but what you sort of qualify for projects in Acton, maybe not what, what Boxborough is going to qualify for their part of the funds, but in the end, we're, we're looking to sort of get a share of those funds for the district because a share of the town's budget's a large share helps to support this di district every year. So as you, as you work with your individual liaison, um, the individual committees that you liaise with, please sort of keep that in the top of mind with them. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Dave. Um, next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, so as always, items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion and a separate vote. I'll read each item name and if any member would like it held, please say hold. Item number one is the approval of the ABRSC meeting minutes of 8-26-2021. Item two is the FY22 assignments and liaisons. 
And item number three is the recommendation to establish a community engagement subcommittee. Okay, hearing none that were hold, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous, thank you. Uh, next item is our subcommittee member reports. Um, for me presenting on the Boxborough Leadership Forum, BLF met, I believe it was last Wednesday. Yes, because this Wednesday was a building committee meeting. Uh, so we met last Wednesday, uh, and, and as I mentioned, a, a good part of our time was taken up discussing the uh, ARPA funds and how those would be processed in the town of Boxborough. Um, and uh, I encouraged both the select boards to talk to each other and also our town managers. Um, and so I think that, um, that from, from hearing from Peter, that seems to be going well at, at this point. Uh, any other reports from members? Do we want to do a building committee report? Do you want me to? I thought Marie was going to do it. <laughs> All right, Marie. No, I can do that. <laughs> um, so building committee met last night. Um, it was a pretty standard, you know, uh, unexciting meeting. Uh, the biggest excitement is the boardwalk is now open for everyone. Um, how many of you have been able to get over to the boardwalk yet? You should make time. It's, I think it's gonna be a beautiful weekend. You really should make time to go see that. That will be a centerpiece of this community and building committee members have already heard from other community members. Just very, very thankful for that, that work. Um, the one remaining item for that is there is interior lighting going in as well. Um, so that will make it a safe area at night. It does comply with kind of down lighting requirements in the town of Acton and everything else, um, but that's in process. Um, the building project is really going well according to plan. Um, one thing that we did talk about last night was the finance side of it because we get a revised project budget from MSBA. Um, you know, the bottom line is we came in under budget by probably about $6 million. Um, however, if you remember, we have about a 50% reimbursement from the state and the state being the state, that $6 million is half theirs. Um, so the actual savings to the town is still several million dollars. That's great. Dave and I have been already talking with the project manager about bond implications. Um, and so we'll be talking about that more as we go on. But right now we're in a good position with what we have. Uh, we don't need to go out to bond anytime soon. That would be something maybe to consider later in the project. Um, the one area of concern we have, we had a lot of early change orders due to underground conditions in the building project to the tune of several million dollars. Um, that has caused the construction contingency to go down to about $500,000, which is a little bit lower than we'd like to see at this point of the project. However, all of the other cost savings from the low bids that we received on the project are rolled into different types of contingency funds, um, which are still available for you. So if at the end of the project, we're still to the positive, all of that money still comes back. So even though the construction contingency is lower than what we'd like, Overall, the project in is really, really good sound financial position. Um, work uh, is progressing very well on the building. Uh, the exterior of the building, we actually have windows starting to go into the building. Um, a lot of the brick exterior facade of the building is underway. The um, rooftop insulation is going in as well, so it looks a lot like a finished roof. Um, and I believe, this is earlier than I anticipated, but I believe they were talking about being weather tight around when, the end of October? October, November. Yeah, October, November. Uh, that building will be weather tight. So that's a very, very exciting step um, to be able to get to. So good, good pro progress on the building project. Thanks, Peter. Um, all right, uh, last item for this ongoing business section is the statements of warrants. Uh, if everyone's reviewed the warrants, the motion language is found at the end of Dave's memo. Would anybody like to read the warrant? motion. John. I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll warrants as follows. Number P2205 dated 826-2021 in the amount of $553,321.67. Payroll deduction warrants as follows. Number 22-005 PR dated 826-2021 in the amount of $211,216.20. Vendor warrant as follows. Number 22-005 dated 
2021 in the amount of $2,461,387.47. Is there a second? Second. Here is seconded. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you. Peter, is there anything in the FYI that you would like to share? Sure, as I mentioned earlier, our annual report should be going into mailboxes in homes very soon. Um, I don't know if anyone's received yours yet, but that should be imminent. Um, the June 2nd enrollment report is included in, in your packet as an FYI. Um, as a reminder, we do our annual enrollment report um, usually in early November. The reason we do it there is we don't certify the current year enrollment until the, we, they look at, the state looks at October 1st as the certified enrollment date, and then there's a process to certify that enrollment, so it actually takes us a month to get that report to you. But you will get an enrollment um, presentation in early November. Um, we included our family communication map, which is kind of the who to contact at every school. Um, you know, one thing we found as a district previously is we had a very extensive map that kind of was like, you know, here's the order of people that you're allowed to talk to in the district. Given the pandemic, we wanted to simplify that and just make sure that when a family needed to contact the school, there was a list of people to contact and then they need to contact who they think is most appropriate. We always do encourage people, if there's a concern, start with the person closest to the concern because they actually have the information to resolve that. Um, so that's the message we wanna continue to send to families. If you have families reaching out to you, I would encourage you to share with them that list of people at each school they can talk to. And we just wanna reiterate that our goal is to always resolve concerns as fast and quickly and efficiently as possible. The way we do that is by making sure people talk directly to the person closest to the concern. Um, so that's the goal. It's not to try and steer people away from leadership or you know concerns. It's to make sure the issues get resolved soon. Um, that's it for me on FYI. Thank you, Peter. All right, there's a need to con convene an executive session under MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Acton Boxborough Education Administration Association, Acton Boxborough Office Support Association, and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Because an open eating meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee, the committee will not return to open meeting. Is there a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Seconded. All right, and we'll do a roll call vote for this one. Kira? Yes. John? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Ben? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Amy? Yes. Ginny? Yes. Nora? Yes. Myself? Yes. <laughs>